if you truly believe that what you're selling holds value and that your words carry meaning, then the less that you push it, the more you're depriving people of that transformation. Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey everyone, before we get started, I have some really exciting news for you. Our famous Fast Foundations Mastermind for all entry-level and early-stage entrepreneurs is now open for enrollment once again. Now, I can promise you that this is hands down the best early stages and entry-level mastermind that is out there, I promise, and for about half the price of everyone else's. But I don't want you to take my word for it. Listen to some of these past members' experiences. My name is James Dunn, and Fast Foundations gave me a family of like-minded entrepreneurs that I know I can count on for support, for guidance, and to help get me through any challenge I'll ever run into in my business. My name is Leanne, and Fast Foundations showed me a step-by-step roadmap and a process to implement into my business immediately, and I saw measurable results right away. My name is Alex Street and Fast Foundations helped me build my first course and confidently now do what I'm made for. Listen, all those breakthroughs you just heard are just the tip of the iceberg. We have so many more of them. And if you make less than $499,000 a year as an entrepreneur, I want you to lock arms with us and we want to help your business explode over the next five and a half months. So here's what you do. Rush over to fastfoundations.com. Literally, right now, go to fastfoundations.com because seats are really limited and they're going really quickly and this thing kicks off the very first week of March. So if you want to be in this room with us working on your business and hearing all the secrets that we've used to make our brands explode, drop what you're doing and go over to fastfoundations.com and claim your spot right away. We can't wait to work with you. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another incredible episode of For the Love of Money. I'm so excited to sit down with Jess Ekstrom today. We were connected through a mutual friend and it was totally meant to be. You are going to love this episode. So Jess is the founder and CEO of Headbands of Hope. And she's also the author of Chasing the Bright Side, which is this really hot new book that uh, just landed on the market. It's a book about optimism. Now, here's why she's the perfect guest for this show. She's an entrepreneur whose company also has a massive giveback component. Get this. For every headband sold, a headband is also donated to a child with cancer. So I want you to picture children with cancer, you know, and, and they don't have hair on their head. And, and she is giving these headbands to these beautiful children so that they can feel, you know, childlike and beautiful and fun and, and just have this bright spot in, in, in their life, right? While they're struggling with something. And because of this give back component and because of her success, they have now donated over a half a million headbands to children battling cancer, reaching every children's hospital in the United States and 15 other countries. Like, is this not why we're all in business? To be profitable and do great things at the same time? So it's, it, listen, it's no wonder um, that you've probably seen her all over TV. I know she's been on the Today Show and Good Morning America and the Hallmark Channel and Inside Edition, Vanity Fair, Forbes, People Magazine, like the all-time pinnacle of media. She has been all over it. And so it's a privilege to have Jess on the show today to hear her story, for her to share some wisdom with you. And by the way, what we get into in this episode, there are so many good takeaways that you can apply to your business and to your life. I'm just going to go on the record and say this is one of my favorite episodes that I've ever done. And I think it's going to be one of your favorites as well. So get ready, listen up, because you're about to have your life and your business totally changed by Jess Ekstrom. Jess, it is such a privilege to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Seriously, my pleasure. We're talking... um, before the show started, before the listeners were listening, how a mutual friend of ours, Lindsay, connected us. I'm so glad that she did. And that's isn't yeah. that how the world's supposed to work, right? Like really epic people connecting other epic people. And, and this is my chance to get connected to you and meet you. So I'm super excited. 
Yeah. Yeah. I was saying Lindsay, you know, she's the founder of powerhouse women and there's a lot of people that stand by the statement of women supporting women and she is living it. So I'm so glad that she connected us. She totally lives that. I love that. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with rapid fire. It's kind of a fun way for my listeners to get to know you in a hurry. And if there's something really good that comes up, we'll definitely circle back around and do a deep dive on it. Are you down? Perfect. Let's do it. Okay. Start real down. Where, where, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Cornelius, North Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. Oh, okay. And where do you live now? I live in an Airstream trailer. <laughs> so my husband and I packed up uh, about a year ago and we hit the road traveling the country and... And it's been absolutely incredible. So I live, you know, home is wherever you are. That statement has become very real. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay, we're definitely circling back around on that one. What's a favorite quote you have? Oh, uh, I have so many favorite quotes. Um, I think that... I actually, one that I just heard today that's sticking out to me, Sarah Blakely, like, Everyone has had a million dollar idea. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that really humanizes the, the idea part of going for it and really empowers people to know that it's all within them. You just have to move. Yeah. I really believe that too, by the way. I believe I that everybody too. has had a handful of quote million dollar ideas and most people just don't act on them. Yeah, exactly. So I think that that's empowering. Yeah. Um, what is one of your superpowers? Oh, one of my superpowers is my ability to figure it out. Mm, God, I think if you that, can be resourceful, that's everything. Oh my gosh. I think that that's something um, I didn't realize I had since a young age. And I love... It's kind of like looking at a big pile of Legos. You either see a mess or you see an opportunity. And I pride myself on seeing the opportunity. So the problem is, unless it's a business concept, I see a mess. If, it, right, if it's exactly. a business concept pile of Legos, I can ex- I can tell you exactly what to do with those. <laughs> Anything else, I just see a mess and I freak out and I hand it over to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I definitely need some Marie Kondo in my life. I am not organized in any other shape or form except when it comes to business. That's awesome. So besides your own, what is one of your favorite books? Oh, one of my favorite books. Um, honestly, I really... I just finished Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. Oh. And I loved that book. I think it just like... I I think I love stories about people before they were big and just it really humanizes that it's within everyone and his story was just really powerful. Um, And so I just, yeah, I just finished Born Crime and I thought that one was really good. You know, I haven't uh, even seen that book of his, but I got a chance to meet him at a charity event. We have a common interest in a charity that we both support and met him at the gala. Just a super kind, nice guy. I'm sure that your meeting with him was way cooler than my meeting with him. I definitely chased him down the streets of Chicago. I was like, Trevor, I love you. He's like, do you want to get a picture? I'm like, yes. And so I tried to play my cool. Probably wasn't as cool as you. Totally fangirl. That's all right. That's all right. I did. I did. It was so so worth it. You got to shoot your shot. That's. I think that's another thing that's like a life motto. It's there. Shoot your shot. I couldn't agree more. What's one of your yeah. all-time favorite accomplishments this far? Donating over half a million headbands to kids with cancer yes. and reaching every single children's hospital in America in 15 countries now. That is so super badass. I mean, that's literally why you're on the show right now. I can't wait to dig into that a little bit more later. A few more of these. Yeah. What's one thing you're challenged by right now? One thing I'm challenged by is being a forward thinker. I think that I'm sure you are as well. I think anyone who has a business idea is always kind of like thinking about what's next. Mm -hmm. But then I think the challenge that I'm having is enjoying things when they actually happen. And because I feel like I skip right over it. And so I'm trying to figure out like, is, can I strike a balance between, you know, like being ambitious, but also living in the moment. And that's what, you know, trying to find that recipe for. Yeah, I think you and I and Lori suffer from that. I think anyone who's yeah. uber ambitious and, and exactly. very accomplished, I think we all kind of suffer from that as the work that we're always doing. Two more. Uh, what is something generous you've done recently? You might have just answered this. Uh, something generous I've done recently. Um, yesterday when I was flying in, maybe this isn't... Maybe this is a little bit more selfish, but I um, pride myself on holding people's babies at TSA. Oh if I see a mom with their hands full, I'm like, "Give me that baby!" Oh my god, <laughs> because I love funny. holding people. So I've definitely held like five babies at TSA. 
partially because I love holding babies, but I think it also helps the mom out while she's breaking down the stroller. I mean, they, I don't have a kids on my own yet, but they, I mean, when I see moms traveling by themselves with kids, I'm like, I don't know how they you do deserve it. a medal. First class should be reserved for them. Yeah, it I literally don't know insane. how they do it. It's nuts. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. So last but yeah, not I least, loved holding that baby. That's so cute. Last but not least, what are you grateful for today? I am grateful for being with my husband. I've been on the road uh, for uh, ever since the book launch. I mean, we're always on the road, but we're usually on the road together. Um, but I've been traveling a lot individually for speaking and book signings. And um, so just being with him and just watching Netflix and drinking coffee in the morning, I've just been so grateful for those little things. Listen, I came from corporate America a long time ago. That is something to be grateful for because yeah. most couples... Uh, now you're in the entrepreneurship world. I'm in the entrepreneurship world. We kind of make our own lifestyles. But most couples are torn apart at 7 a.m. in the morning. They go chase separate dreams. They come home tired, mm -hmm. too tired to talk about the dreams that they just chased. And it's a real privilege to be the antithesis of that type of lifestyle. It's so true. I think, you know, and you hit the nail on the head. Sometimes when you're done with all of it, you're, there's not enough energy to to communicate about it. Mm -hmm. And so to have, you know, more than a few days at home where we can both kind of like reset and, um, you know, play games. Like we love playing games together. We love playing like ping pong. The place that we're at right now has pickleball. So we've become mean pickleball players. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's awesome. Let's start there, by the way. So let's go a little deeper in the, the interview. And this is a great spot to start literally where you are today. So you guys are mm -hmm. living in an Airstream motorhome. You're traveling... Mm -hmm the world, or at least the United States with your hubby. And mm -hmm. by the way, when I was stalking you before this interview, did I see a golden doodle or a sheep -a doodle as well? Oh, a standard poodle. He's asleep on my feet right now. So if he oh. barks during this interview, oh. I apologize. If he apologize. barks during that, that'll be just yeah. like our house. Like that is par yeah. for the course. It's always like whenever I'm about to do something important, he's like, I should bark at someone walking by. But yeah, so we have a 70 pound standard poodle that's also along for this ride. Is he what they call a party poodle? Yes, Yeah, Chris, because of the coloring. You know that? Well, because of the yes. coloring. That's why I thought he might be a sheep -a doodle or something. They have the really oh cool um, black and white or brown and white like markings and spots to them. Yes, no one knows the term party. And so every time... when We, we didn't know when we got him. I found him on Craigslist. And uh, we learned that he was a party poodle. We were like, we got a party animal on our <laughs> hands <laughs> over here. The best part is I spent years thinking it was party, like P-A-R-T-Y, like drinking yeah, and partying. Party. It's like T-I. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. totally different. It's like, like a real name of one. I, I kind of liked it better when I thought it was a true party party. But okay. I would, I, you know, will be in trouble if I don't say this. We don't cut him like a regular poodle. We just shave him like a regular dog. Yeah. Because my husband is like, He's a poodle, but he's like a man's poodle. You know, he's, <laughs> he's not, he's not like a frou frou poodle. Oh my God. So yeah, you can check him out on my Instagram, but he is not cut like no balls on the head or anything like that. <laughs> that is, he, he's so cute. That's, I saw that picture and I was like, oh, the, I immediately love these two. We just got a new sheep a doodle because oh, um, cool. we lost our golden doodle a, a few weeks oh. ago. And this, oh, this sorry. sheep a doodle is keeping me up. So he's 10, 10 weeks old right now. Oh, he's keeping gosh. me up all night, every night. I haven't had a regular night's sleep. And I'm not exaggerating. In two and a half weeks, I have not. Oh. I've been up three or four times every single night in the middle of the night. Cause that's my job. I let Lori sleep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it worth it though? Is the cuteness yeah. just so worth it's it? It's totally worth it. They add so yeah. much, don't they? Oh my gosh. I think that like, I was kind of going through a funk one mm -hmm. before I got Ollie, which is my dog's name. And I, I didn't really know what was up. And um, I think that after I got him it reminded me to be playful again. I, I felt like I used to really be a playful person and want to, you know, play games and go outside. And I got so um, focused on my business. And then all of a sudden things started to not seem as fun anymore. Mm. And uh, which is really why you started it in the first place. Do you mm. have this fun adventure? And then after I got Ollie um, and you have to go outside, you know, and walk your dog, you have to kind of sometimes get on the ground and play with those toys mm. It like brought something out of me that I felt like um, was kind of buried under all this laundry. I was like, mm -hmm. "Oh, that's still there," and oh. he he did that. That's really cool. See, they play such an important role. Well, where I was going really with does. Yeah. before we got sidetracked on the dog, yeah. where I was going with this is <laughs> this is um, a dog podcast, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what is it like to be traveling the country in an Airstream motorhome, and where did this idea come from? So my parents were also entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And about five years ago, they sold their company and they sold everything they owned. 
And they got in an RV and they've been traveling ever since. So they've been on the road for five years now. Wow. And they just became park rangers, which I think is absolutely no adorable. Yeah, I will show you a picture. It's so funny. Um, my dad's like such a handy guy. So he's always doing like fix it stuff. My mom can talk to a tree. So she's like greeting people at the ranger station. Um, but I would go and visit them at these different national parks. And um, you know, if I had speaking engagements or things like that, I would go say, hey. And I just thought it was so cool that they would be able to travel and see all these places, but they would sleep in the same bed every night. Yeah. And that they had that familiarity of a home. And so that's when that spark kind of flickered. And then I was kind of... I was going on the road all the time um, for my business and for um, just different things. And I would always leave Jake and Ollie. And I'm like, I wish we could just do this together. And so we were at dinner one night and um, we call it the coconut shrimp that changed our life <laughs> because we were like, literally eating coconut shrimp. And we're like, we should just do it. You know, why not? And the next day we got up and still felt the same way. And I just kind of did a little bit of research. And I really knew I liked the, the look and feel of like Airstream trailers. And so I just went on their contact form and just reached out. It's like, Hey, you know, this is me. This is what I do. We're interested in having this. You guys do partnerships. And sure enough, they said yes. And uh, we got on a call. And then like around six or seven months later, we left, you know, Raleigh and our Airstream trailer and um, have been on the road for about a year now ever since. But so I think it was like... sponsor yeah. you with this Airstream trailer to do this? In a way. So we're ambassadors for Airstream. And that so we do... Ass. Way to go. Blogs for that. Yeah. So we like test out new... Um, you know, they now have this thing called Airstream Connected. So you can kind of turn your Airstream into a Wi-Fi hub. So like entrepreneurs can, uh, can work from the road and... Um, and then they've you know been promoting the book and the tour and uh, so I think it's like I think making the ask mm-hmm. has been such a big part of the some of the successes I've had has not been because of like the skills that I knew but because of like the willingness to ask wow. has been a big part of it. That's a really good lesson for everybody, by the way. Like we could just end the podcast right here and they're like, wait, if I would just ask, I could get a free yeah. Airstream motorhome. Like I need to do right. This. Well, I always say like it's so true. The People aftermath- don't ask what they need. No, and like the aftermath of a no is not life ruining, but the aftermath of a yes could be life changing. So when you look at your odds, you might as well just make the ask. Whoa. Sometimes a no can can feel life ruining, but it's really not. But when you think of what could be on the other side of a yes, I mean, you could be traveling the country in an airstream trailer. That's one of the best ways that anyone's ever put that. By the way, that really drives. Oh, me thanks. Home. So what's been I appreciate the best that. part, and what's been the biggest challenge of? Working from the road. I think the best part has been forcing me to unplug. There are some places where I physically will not be able to get a bar of cell service or a thing of Wi-Fi. And I need to have... It's, I have no other option but for like 4 days to be off the grid. Mm-hmm. And you know, I can try to set boundaries and stuff where I'm like, okay, it's five o'clock. I'm turning away from my phone, but it's really it always feels there. Mm-hmm. So w- being off the grid sometimes has really let me be able to do a lot of the deep work that um, gets in the way when you constantly have like Slack messages coming up or mm-hmm. you're accessible to people. And I'll also say that that's where I've met the most people is when we are off the grid. It's when people actually talk to each other because there's nothing else to do, you know, at yeah. campgrounds and things like that. So I've met some really cool people. Um, and I would say the hardest part though has been community. Um, you know, coming from Raleigh, I had some great, a great network there, great people. You know, I have my team in North Carolina and. And it's something like you never realize the power of just people mm-hmm. and that familiarity and just that morning cup of coffee that you might have with someone for 15 minutes or just walking your dog with your neighbor that uh, that that part's been hard because yeah. you're constantly meeting new people, yeah. which is great. But then sometimes it's hard to get that, that settled feeling. Sometimes these romantic ideas, when I say romantic, I, like in concept or on paper, they're really fancy and shiny looking. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they're not what they're necessarily cracked up to be no. once yeah. you're in full execution of them. And the only reason I say that is Lori and I thought when we were living in Minneapolis eight years ago, that we would spend summers in Minneapolis and winters out here in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. And after a few months of being out here, we realized people from back home were starting to detach because that's what humans mm-hmm. do, literally subconsciously. 
So those friendships were suffering. And then people out here didn't really want to go deep with you because they you appeared transient. They knew you were going to leave. Yeah. And so that's interesting. a few months into it, we're like, this is not going to work going back and forth. Number one, it's not mm-hmm. as, as awesome as what we thought it was going to be. And number two, I had fallen in love with LA. I was like, like I found home and I didn't want mm-hmm. to go back. So we planted roots out here. And what so to what you were just saying, planting those roots, not mm-hmm. just in life, but even in business. Like having proximity to all the doers, Mm -hmm. it's a really important thing. Proximity and also clarity. You know, it's like, you're not like, well, sometimes I live here and sometimes I live there. You're like, no, I live here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important in business too, is to be able to have that clarity of like, nope, this is what I do. And I think I was a little scattered for a little bit because, you know, I started Headbands of Hope eight years ago out of my dorm room and and then it started turning into this thing where I was then doing speaking and books and, and all this other stuff. And I felt a little blurry as to like, wait, am I, am I a headband company? Am I a speaker? What am I doing? And so I knew that I had to get that like one thread of clarity. And for me, it's just about helping people believe in better. And I can do that through Headbands of Hope with those like small accessories that make a big impact. I can do that through speaking engagements, book writing. But it's important to have that know that like this is what I do. Yeah. You know? It's, that's incredible. Okay. So you actually just took me where I wanted to go next. And I wanted to take you back to college. Like take me back mm-hmm. to that dorm room when you started your incredible company, Headbands of Hope. Tell us that story. Most college students are not starting a for-profit, for-cause type of mm-hmm. movement. They're barely waking up in the morning. So I was still like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would still go out and uh, be a kid. But uh, I was doing this internship at Make-A-Wish and I was seeing a lot of kids that were losing their hair to chemotherapy. And the first reaction would be to give them a wig or to give them a hat to cover up their heads. And I just thought it was so cool that a lot of the kids that wasn't on their agenda to like hide their heads. Mm -hmm. They wanted to just feel good about themselves and feel like a kid. And so they would wear these headbands. And I thought it was just the coolest gesture of confidence that they were like, nope, I got a headband, you know, I'm good to go. And so I started to look up organizations that provided headbands to kids with cancer and couldn't really find any. And it was just kind of this like, it wasn't, you know, I think a lot of people think that inspiration is like this aha moment or, you know, when like, that's how Raven sees the future and it's like time stands still. And it's really for me, and I don't think for a lot of people, it's like that. I just had this flicker of an idea and it wasn't until I was working with this one girl who wanted to go to Disney World uh, specifically to meet Sleeping Beauty. Um, she was she, she had a brain tumor and then she ended up being too sick to go on her trip. And then uh, I actually arrived on her doorstep dressed as Sleeping Beauty to try to make her wish come true. And it was like the clearest before and after moment of my life. It was just this like two hours on a Saturday that I felt like completely changed the trajectory of everything that I thought I knew. And I think that sometimes when we think about doing good work, we think about like the good effects, but sometimes we don't think about the seed that it originated from. Mm -hmm. And usually that is something hard Mm -hmm. and hard times actually give us a choice. You know, they can be the excuse as to why we do less, or they can be the reason as to why we do more. Mm -hmm. And I wanted this time with this girl to be the reason as I wanted to be able to connect the dots from her to something that I did because Mm -hmm. of her. And so I kind of went back to this headband idea. And funny enough, the founder of Tom's Shoes uh, had just spoken at my school a few weeks prior about this one-for-one model that he wanted companies to replicate and do this kind of for-purpose business. And so I started Headbands of Hope out of my dorm room, uh, end of my junior year. For every headband sold, one is donated to a child with cancer. And that was uh, April 25th, 2012. We got our first order from my mom. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, why are and, parents uh, always the first? I know. Customers? I'm like, mom, just let me live my life, okay? No, but she's she's been our number one customer. But no, we've had uh, it's it's been a wild ride. Even Khloe Kardashian is a customer of ours wow, now, so it's that's been crazy. So cool, yeah. good for you. Well, first of all, congratulations. That's thank you. It's a beautiful story. It's a remarkable reason to start a company. I guess it kind of leads me to my next question: Is a lot of people listening? I have to believe they wouldn't be listening to this show in particular unless they had two things in common with you. And that was one, 
they have the entrepreneurial bug, the entrepreneurial spirit, and two, mm-hmm. they have something that they want to contribute towards more or, or be more giving towards, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that there is this section called for profit for cause. Mm-hmm. And that's what you are, correct? Right. Yes. Okay. That's so what I am. how come you didn't just start a charity, just start a foundation? Mm-hmm. Why did you choose for profit for cause? So if I was really inspired by this, you know, revolution. I felt like Blake with Tom's was beginning. And I agreed with the notion that you shouldn't have to choose between making a living and making a difference. I believe that you should be able to do both at once. And the this kind of old belief that in order to do good things, it has to be selfless, yeah. I think is dated. Yeah. And uh, if you are able to get paid and do good work, then you're be able to devote more of your time and energy to that because you have a lifestyle to support it. And so I was able to throw everything I had into starting Headbands of Hope and and I, I wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like this thing where it was this cash cow from the beginning, but it had the ability to support my life as I was building it. And so therefore I could put all of my time and attention in it. And I was able to hire, eventually hire talent and build a team and um, offer them, you know, competitive salary. And, and I don't think that we would be what we are today without it. And I kind of, don't want my life to be this tug of war between passion and paycheck. And I don't think other people should have to do that either. Wow. I love how you stated that. By the way, how do you reach a Khloe Kardashian and and turn her into a customer? (laughs) Um, Well, you know, Oprah hasn't called me back. So, (laughs) uh, you know, I said like, I, I would say that a lot of our wins, like the, the media, the celebrities have been, because of throwing darts. Mm. It's like, if you just keep throwing darts, it, it, even if you start throwing darts and you're terrible at it, if you keep throwing, you are bound to one day hit a bullseye. Yep. So a lot of times with entrepreneurship, and this might be contrary to what a lot of your guests say, I would argue sometimes it's really not about this precise strategy. Mm-hmm. It's about this like mass quantity of just going for it and moving. And the more you know, darts you throw, the greater, the more you'll learn along the way, and the greater your likelihood is that someone will hit. So we do tons of celebrity gifting and mailing, and you know, we've worked with PR firms. And I think this one landed because there was this Mother's Day gift roundup that we paid to be a part of, and and we gave some headbands. It was like to Khloe Kardashian, like Chrissy Teigen, everyone that was like new moms. And uh, it just so happened that Chloe and her baby True wore these headbands in the Caribbean and they were photographed. And then the next thing you know, it's E! News and people and, you know, where'd she get that cute, you know, baby turban? And we're like, that's us. And so it was uh, cool. But it, again, it came of like eight years of no's. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it's your persistence. And like you said, just chucking darts and, mm-hmm. and not being attached to the outcome, but being attached to the number of, of throws that you're making. I think that's such a great lesson for people who, especially in the beginning, when they're so caught up on, I don't know how to do it yet, or mm-hmm. I don't know what I don't know. Instead of just taking action, I'd rather yeah. them take a whole bunch of inspired, sloppy action than yeah. have them wait till they think they're ready. Right. I, I mean, our motto is that failure will always feel better than regret. Oh. And it's like, And in fact, you know, I I would encourage people to call it research and not failures because you have more information, you have more data, you have more experience to make better decisions about the future. So that's not a failure in my eyes. No, that's incredible. Okay, so obviously you've made an incredible difference. You've given away over a half a million dollars in headbands. Is that right? Or half a million? Half a million headbands. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's insane. Yeah. Okay, so in that massive body of work, of doing good work, this might be a tough one to answer, but is there a moment, is there a, a person, is there a, a situation that really stands out to you that's one of your favorites with your, where you realize you're really making a difference? Man, we have um, this giving gallery on our website wherever we get like pictures from families and letters, you know, we kind of throw it in this giving gallery. So sometimes whenever I'm feeling down, I'll just open that up and start scrolling through it. But something in the beginning, um, when I was first starting Headbands of Hope, and I just wasn't even sure if this was going to work. I hadn't made a dime. I'd had a really kind of crappy beginning, to say the least, of starting my business and gotten a deal with a bad manufacturer that ended up 
stealing money and it was, I lost this loan that I had and it was just really bad. And so I, I was kind of like one foot in, one foot out. And um, I started donating headbands to hospitals before I even really matched the sales because I was like, if I can just get, you know, get this in front of people and show people what I'm doing and show the impact of what this can have, then maybe people will start to believe. Mm-hmm. And so I, I got a letter one day from this mother who she said her daughter was um, in remission for cancer, but she still had like checkups that she had to go to. And she was supposed to be starting kindergarten. She didn't want to go to school because her hair hadn't grown back. And she thought everyone would think that she was a boy and she wouldn't go. And she went to the hospital for her checkup and she got a headband from Headbands of Hope. And the mom said that when she got home from school, she laid out her backpack and her dress and her whole kindergarten outfit and school supplies and said, Mom, when does kindergarten start? And it was just this one simple accessory that could just do this total 180 for her confidence. And I remember when I got that letter, I was like, this is going to (laughs) work. You know, all of a sudden, I think I put two foot feet in, you know, right after I got that. I was like, no, this this is going to happen. That's such an important moment in not just to you and, and not just obviously to them, but in everyone who's benefit in some way from this company that you've created because that sounds like it was a very mm-hmm. pivotal pivotal moment that kind of kept you going. Yeah. And I think um, the bad points have been pivotal moments. You know, talking about this manufacturer that I had a bad deal with in the beginning. Keep I think about it that, was... Because we learn a yeah. lot from those situations. Do you mind sharing oh, what happened? Yeah. Absolutely. So I was looking for someone to get the headbands made. You know, I had the website, I had things going. I was like, all right, we're almost there. Uh, ended up finding this factory in Kansas that I was in communications with for about like two months. We'd have meetings, what were we going to do, what headbands were we going to create. Finally, they sent me this um, product, They were, this sample, and they said, what about this? And I said, great, let's do it. And so they sent me over the invoice to do this first round of production. And it was for $10,000. And I was like, what? But I also didn't have any gauge as to like what things mm-hmm. cost. You know, this... In, and I also didn't have the confidence to ask because I had this kind of this like made up hierarchy in my head that when you're a beginner, you're not allowed to ask questions because you might look stupid or, you know, oh, I should just be thankful that they're working with me. I had all this kind of crap in my head that um, I know now is, you know, BS. But at the yeah. time, I was like, it, it was just there. Yeah. And, um, so I was like, this is a pickle. This is about $9,500 more than what I had in my bank account. I'm 18 years old. And so I'm starting to do some research of like, what I'm going to do. Am I going to try to get a loan from a bank? You know, should I get... Can I get an investor? Or get, How can I do this? And so I'm talking to my dad, who's also an entrepreneur, telling him about this predicament. And he's like, look, I've seen your business plan. I really think that you this is going to be something big and i don't want you to have to be tied to a bank or mm-hmm. investors i believe in this i will be your first investor wow yeah. go dad i know i was like this and i recognize the privilege behind that too i mean financially but also emotionally to have this like safety net of a family i think it was it enabled me to like run and not walk in the beginning mm-hmm. um but did you fight him on so valuation? Excited. What's that? Did you fight him on valuation? I know, right? I'm like, we're worth more than this. No, I didn't even know what a valuation was. But uh, so I remember I went to the bank and it was a Friday afternoon. I remember thinking I want them to get the money before the weekend. Mm-hmm. Wired them $10,000 and I never heard from them again. Oh. Yeah. The worst. Oh. I mean, it was like... it cut me so deep. And I was so embarrassed. I was like, I felt felt like I failed my dad. Mm. And it was just this time where I was like, who did I think that I was to think that I could do something like this? But then, you know, I remember going to bed one night after all this was happening. And if you're like me, you run through all your biggest life's mistakes before you go to bed, you know, as you're closing Mm -hmm. your eyes. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, this is a this company is about solving a problem. And I can live with the embarrassment of failure. Like that's fine. I can't live with what I feel like is like this itch not being scratched. 
and this this hole not being filled. Yeah. And so I got this three hundred dollar grant from my school that was they were giving them out to students who were starting businesses, and I bought this whole three hundred dollars. Whole three hundred dollars, I know. This is really it was was a starting point to say the least. And I bought two headbands from this supplier in Bismarck, North Dakota, that I found on Etsy, and I threw those two headbands up on my website April twenty fifth. And now we have over. 200 products on our own website and I never took outside money again. And I was able to... I think that moment, first of all, it showed me how resilient I could be. Mm-hmm. But second of all, it showed me how resourceful I could be because I was so scarred from getting outside money that I was like, I never want to do that again. Mm-hmm. And so I found ways to make money like within my business that maybe I wouldn't have done before. Like Speaking became the way that I could then fund um, these next iterations of my business without having to get any outside investors and grow it into a multi million dollar company. That's incredible. So, you just, yeah. by, by the way, you just brought up speaking. And I remember talking with you a, a little earlier. Um, mm-hmm. You actually help women get paid to speak or learn how to get paid to speak. And yeah. you just said that's one of the ways that you were able to use that as a cash injection into your business. Do you mind expanding on that a little bit? Like, there, mm-hmm. there are so many people I wish I could get paid to speak. How, how does somebody yeah. break into that market? I remember when I started Headbands of Hope, I got an email from Marshall University and they were like, what is your rate to speak? We've and all gotten that email like, for the first time right? ever. You're like, oh shit, I yeah. don't know. And what you're like, it? what? Like, I, and my first question was like, people pay for this? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I remember saying to them, I was like, this is an honor. Just buy me dinner and cover my travel and let's call it a day. That was your response? I would be, Literally. So my first gig, I said, was for a slice of pizza. Because I was like, I can't even take your money. I like, this is such an honor to speak to your students. Um, But then, you know, I think that speaking is your best form of marketing. And so then once you speak once and and you get that testimonial and start spreading the word. And so then, I, I mean, I'm jumping ahead, but now I speak close to like 40 or 50 times a year. And it's become my main role within the company. And, uh, uh, one of the trends that I noticed was I would be speaking at these like business conferences or tech conferences, and and I would be the only woman on that wow. speaker lineup. And sometimes I would even ask the event organizers, like, "Oh, how did you find me? You know, what what about me and my story made you book me to speak?" And a lot of times they would say that they needed a woman. And oh my they god, couldn't. Lori got that once too. It's the really most insulting, crazy, demeaning uh-huh. reason to be asked to be on a stage. Yeah. And on one hand, I'm like, appreciate your honesty. But on the other hand, I'm like, do you know anything about me? You know, or did you just see that I was a capable speaker and book me? You know, so um, I saw that there was this kind of perfect storm happening. Mm -hmm. There were companies that were getting shit on, for lack of a better word, for not having diverse lineups. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for speakers. There's not a ton of female speakers out there that are charging. You know, a lot of them say, Oh, I just love to tell my story, just similar to what I said. But then there's audiences that are not looking for these like robotic lectures speakers. They want someone with a real story that's relatable, that's human, that can then face it outward and say, What can I take for this in my life? Mm-hmm. And so Women have these amazing stories, but sometimes they don't feel like they're qualified to either A, speak it, or B, get paid to tell it. Mm -hmm. And so I created Mic Drop Workshop, which is an online course and community for women to help them get paid to workshop. Mic Drop Workshop. That's a pretty sick name. Thank you. It was one of those moments where I was like, oh my God, if this domain is available, I have to do this. And it was. (laughs) (laughs) Have you ever made business decisions? I know. Sometimes I make business decisions based off of domain availability. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like then I'm in. So yeah, that was like a little over a year ago. I I launched it and we have over, you know, a thousand women in the course. And uh, people have gotten TED Talks from it. They some people have fully transitioned out of their jobs and are now full-time speaking. And a lot of times it wasn't even like... And maybe I'm not selling my course this way, but I'm just being honest. Sometimes it wasn't even these big mass changes that they had to make. It was just the permission to do it. You know, It was like, no, you're not going to charge $200. Beginning speakers can... My first paid gig was for $2,500. And so it's it's there. What what should the expectation be if... 
Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. I'm going down this rabbit hole. I'm just fascinated. Oh, by no, it. I love it. Yeah, um, I, I feel like we need to be talking know, uh, about this People with really great stories that should be on stages and mm-hmm. should be paid to tell these stories, but no one knows how to crack into that. So like, mm-hmm. number one, how do you even start to book a paid speaking gig? And what should the mm-hmm. realistic expectation be for the average woman or person out there? Yeah. So the low-hanging fruit, the first thing that you need to do is you need to make it known that you're a speaker. Mm -hmm. And you can do that by either having your own personal website, like your domain name, or have a speaking tab on your current website. But a lot of people are like, how am I getting speaking gigs? I'm like, no one even knows that you're a speaker. Mm -hmm. You know, Put it on your LinkedIn, put it on your social media, let people know that you're a speaker. And the second thing is video. And you can even do this like ask your like local chamber or high school if you can come speak and just set up a camera. It, it doesn't have to be this huge mass produced thing. Mm-hmm. But in order for people to pay, you know, five thousand plus, um, they're just gonna want to see a two minute clip mm-hmm. of you speaking. Yeah, they're so not those gonna take your word for it. Like right. my they're audience, like, trust me, brand. I'm a good job. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't have to be something big, but having just a short clip of you speaking, we've even had some speaker sisters and mic drop workshop is what we call them, speaker sisters, get together and, um, and, and like, uh, share a videographer Mm -hmm. and just like put on their own little small gathering so they can get footage. So, um, those are the two just small things that you can do is make it known that you're a speaker, get footage, and then think about who's in your network that maybe does have speakers, you know, or that does book speakers. But I would say like, you know, to look at the real picture of what you can make with speaking, beginner speakers can really make, you know, $500 to $3,000 off of their first gig. And then uh, it kind of moves. There's a lot of like associations, chamber events, schools that are booking around that $5,000 range. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you're speaking, you know, 10 plus times a year, that number can move to 10,000 plus. And I mean, it's a really great way to make an income with just by telling your story. And a lot of times people aren't looking for perfect, they're looking for real and they want to be able to see themselves within that speaker. So a lot of times we take ourselves out of the game because we think we have to have this like theory, this like groundbreaking disruptor. Yeah. But a lot of times it's just about, you know, taking our daily life and using it to help others. And entrepreneurs have really great ways of doing that. Wow. Wow. I love that we just talked about the subject because there's I know it's on the minds of so many people listening. Mm-hmm. They've got great messages. They want the PR from it. They don't know where to be to, to even get started. Uh shameless plug, how do they get your course? Go to micdropworkshop.com. So you can go to mydropworkshop.com uh, or you can also just go to my website, jessextrom.com and there's courses on there. Awesome. Okay. Totally love it. So yeah. um, this must have kind of been what all built up to and led to your awesome new book, Chasing the Bright Side, right? Yes. What yeah. made you write it? So Chasing the Bright Side uh, came out with HarperCollins in November and... I actually have loved writing forever. I was in Chicken Soup for the Soul when I was in sixth grade, and that was when I really peaked, you know. But <laughs> it was, I've always loved writing and wondered like how it would come back into my life. And I think that when I started telling my story on stages and realized how um, much I could do with one hour of their time, I'm like, imagine what I could do with five hours of their time mm-hmm. with a book. Uh, and I really, that book, man. It was, yes, it's about Headbands of Hope, but it is about so much more than that Mm -hmm. and how uh, we can really use optimism as the new grit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about hearts and flowers. It's not about, you know, just like being naive and and seeing the good. It's uh, sometimes about when we have no other choice but to go up from here. Mm -hmm. And so I get pretty pretty deep and talk about uh, my family. We were in this... um, pretty big scandal in high school that was really public. And uh, you and your family was, were. Yeah. You guys buying um, your way into college? That's like w- no, yeah, there was not <laughs> that. Oh, sounds familiar. But um, no, I have a, a relative that uh, was like one of the biggest frauds of our time. And oh, wow. it was so of course, like the whole family kind of got had the grunt of it from a media perspective. And it was something that I didn't really understand how it played a role in my life until I really sat down to write this book. And I was like, if I'm going to write a book about optimism, 
I have to tell the full story about mm-hmm. how I got here. And so it was pretty crazy kind of releasing that into the world. Um, People Magazine did an exclusive the day it came out. And it was, um, it's been really cool to see that it's kind of uh, not in my, but not a skeleton in my closet anymore. And a lot of people have like messaged me and come forward about just things that have happened in their life that they didn't really want to own until now. And we can all kind of just realize even the messy parts are just a part of your story. Wow. It's so true. It really is. And and the more you try and keep them down or hide them, the more anxiety it's going to cause you and the more it's going to hold you back from everything that you want to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, that's that's why I wrote Chasing the Bright Side is not to tell this perfect picture of a startup, but to tell the the messy parts and how we can really just continue to believe that the future is good. I once heard you say in an interview, and I think you're being interviewed about this book, but it was something like, optimism is not a mood. It's a strategy. Did I get that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you got it. You it nailed totally it. resonated with me. Explain. Mm-hmm. So optimism isn't about, you know, how we how we feel. You know, it's not about just being happy all the time. I think sometimes there's a pressure, especially with social media, to just be at our best, live life at our highest volume. But optimism is more of a strategy to bring the good. Mm-hmm. And even when those times are tough. And sometimes it means taking all those like external things away. So, you know, one of the parts of the book is really like auditing the things that we're chasing. Mm -hmm. If no one knew about it, would it still matter to us? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can be really hard to, um, to like draw a line between achievements and success. You know, what are the things that are measurable in our life that are maybe these tangible accolades? And then what are the things that truly mean, like feel successful to us? Uh, so it's, it's really cool to feel like we, we can train optimism as like more of a muscle in our brain yeah. that becomes more like habitual over time. That's important because I feel like most people's default to be really frank is pessimism. They've been beaten up mm-hmm. in life. They've been trained to expect something to go wrong. I even know yeah. people who they make the statement. I hate this statement, but so many people say it. They're like, oh, oh God, what's the statement? It's like when everything's going so well, they're like, Waiting for something to go wrong. You know oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, like waiting for the tides crazy. to turn. Crazy, yeah. Me like too. are expecting yeah. something to go wrong any moment now. That kind of... Well, right. Default. And I, I think it's also like um, the tone that is set right now in the media with how divided we are in politics mm-hmm. and, and, and just everything is trying... And also negativity sells. You know, yeah. it's like... It's it's clickbait. Okay, and so, so we're being so bombarded easy. with pessimism. It's right. Media, yeah. It's everything. Okay, so how, it's how so do we normal. Switch this default then, if 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 we're already kind of pessimistic, and mm-hmm. if the media is reinforcing that because that's the only thing that sells, mm-hmm. then how do we shift our default to one of optimism? One of the analogies I give in the book, and maybe this will be an easy kind of something that's digestible, and then you can dive further into it and in chasing the bright side, is that boiling water can soften a potato, but harden an egg. So it's not as much about the circumstance as it is about the subject. And so we can take all this negativity that's surrounding us, the headlines, the the arguing, you know, the pessimism, and we have a choice as to what it does to us. You know, we can either like feel like a victim or we can say, what can, what is my role here? You know, what can I do to help like bring something better? And so I like to say, you know, our we can't control our experiences, but we can always write our stories. Mm, I love that. Okay, so where can we find you? Where can we get the book? Yes, uh, you can get the book, chasingthebrightside.com. Uh, it's obviously available on Amazon, just like everything else in the world. Uh, it's also sold in Walmart. And you can find me on Instagram at Jess underscore Ekstrom. And my website is Jess Ekstrom. I love and it. And you every- can get headbands at headbandspope.com. I love it. Every, okay, here's your list, everyone. You have to go get the headbands. Then you have yes. to pick up the book. Then you have yeah. to follow her on Instagram. <laughs> this is your anything? shopping list. Oh, then you no. got to start your speaking then, career. And then you got to follow me in the airstream. No, actually, yes. let's do that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that might be getting a little creepy. Yeah. Careful what yeah. you ask for, you just might get it, right? <laughs> uh, uh, no, if you see an airstream going down the highway that says chasing the bright side, give us a honk. Oh, it's all branded up? Yeah, yeah, it is. That is awesome. So yeah. when Lori's book came out, I so badly wanted to wrap a massive motorhome. And take it like on tour with yeah. her. Yeah. And uh, that never materialized, but I, I still kind of like have oh, it's, that it's in the back happen. of my mind for yeah. something that we do. 
And when that time comes, you call me because I have a lot of tips Advice. to tell you guys. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> consider that done. All right, very last question. I'll ask everyone this question. I'm so curious to get it from your perspective. Give me a reason why people should be more unapologetic about their pursuit mm. of success. Don't deprive the world of your gifts because you're afraid to sell them. Mm. And that was something I had to like literally paint on my eyelids with this book is I felt weird. I'm like, I can sell headbands all day long. But then when it came to selling my words, I was like, oh, does this sound self-promotional? You know, is this, uh, who wants to listen to me? But if you truly believe that what you're selling holds value and that your words carry meaning, Mm -hmm. then the less that you push it, the more you're depriving people of that transformation. Wow. That is awesome. One awesome way to put a bow on this. Jess Ekstrom, thank you so much for being on the show. You are... I can't believe... I'm looking at it's almost 50 minutes, five zero minutes that flew by. Yeah. That was yeah. Crazy. Thanks, Chris. I could have talked to you all day. I appreciate you having me. Well, you you seriously delivered so much value. It's one of my it's gonna be one of my favorite episodes. So thank you. Oh, good, good. Well, I'm sure there is more to come from us. Appreciate you being on. Thanks. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.